Hello, I'm Lino Camprovi. I'm speaking actually from New Orleans, from my hotel, and this should be proof of it. I made some mistakes, somebody else made some mistakes, so the things that I came to the city, I came to shot, but then I'm leaving Saturday morning and the session overlaps with the time of my flight. So um, this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to record a brief version of my paper, and then hopefully you'll be able to take it into account in, in the discussion if you feel like it and John Krieger would be nice enough to, to include the paper in the small commentary and hopefully also you will be able to send me your individual comments as, as audience to my email which is L Camprubi, so my the first letter of my name and then my last name at us.es okay Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about frontier technologies, making of new maritime boundaries and maritime space, and also the role of peripheral, peripheral countries in this. Basically, the point is that for many, many centuries, um, the seas were considered free spaces, free from sovereignty, in the sense that um, the doctrine of the freedom of the seas enabled ships particularly if you were British, to travel wherever you wanted in the globe without any other country claiming sovereignty over the waters you were, you were sailing through, except for three miles offshore. And these three miles were defined as the canyon shot rule. They were defined by how far can a canyon from land reach. So as you can see, the definition of maritime sovereignty of territorial waters was very much pegged to to the available technologies to defend sovereignty. This is the situation in the part of the 17th, because the doctrine was previously Mare Clausum, 18th century and 19th century. Of course, contested in several places, but then counter contested by the power of the, of the British Maritime Empire and also the Dutch and others. This starts to change as humans developed technologies that enable them to access the maritime space. And I'm talking about things like the telegraph, which basically means that infrastructures began to be built in a space which was previously thought to be void of human constructions. And Hugo Grotius, who was in the 17th century, one of the main proponents and defendants of the doctrine of the Mare Liberum, the freedom of the seas, his argument was precisely that people cannot build stable structures at sea. So what was the point of attributing territory, of attributing sovereignty? Well, this changes the moment you have telegraphs, but it changes even more the moment you have, and this is 1920s, 1930s, offshore drilling facilities. The, uh, the ability to be able to build and maintain structures offshore necessitated or demanded a change of the rules. And this was performed or realized in 1945 by the Truman administration, who issued an unilateral degree saying the territory of the United States reaches as far as the seabed of its continental shelf. This meant effectively that the water between the surface and the seabed was considered high seas, so the freedom of the seas doctrine prevailed, but the seabed was considered part of the territory. And this is, this is an interesting legal fiction because, well, land ends where the sea starts, right? But the argument was, well, no, land ends where the continental shelf ends. And this is obviously an argument that you can only make when you know what a continental shelf is and when you have the technologies, uh, but also the scientific knowledge, in this case in geology, to map and chart a space that until very recently before was very much unknown. Of course, people in the 19th century and the US in particular, the US Navy dev devoted huge efforts to sound with ropes um, and chart the, the seabed, but the ability to do so with sonar, as was possible in the first 
third and first half of the 20th century is one of the reasons, together with the possibility of building offshore drilling facilities, that mm, that possibilitated, po sorry, made possible the this notion of my territory reaches until where my continental uh, shelf reaches. Okay, so from this narrative, it would seem that core technological countries had the initiative and, and had a huge advantage when redefining the maritime space, right? Because if I'm saying that in order to, to do that, in order to change from the freedom of the seas doctrine into something completely different, you need to develop the technologies and those technologies were not always easy to develop and they were mm, sonar in particular very much linked to war and if you are one of the winners in the war effort and a big power, you're, the chances are that you're going to be able to develop better sonar and use it in larger quantities. So the ability to charge the continental shelf was at the time limited to a few countries. It would seem that then the making of the new global doctrine of the sea was a matter of some core and non-peripheral countries. However, immediately after the Truman administration's decree in 1945, in the, in the years following, countries such as Chile, Ecuador, and Peru put forward also unilateral claims for their own territorial waters. And in this case, they expanded them even more, not only to their respective continental shelves, but for 200 nautical miles. And their argument was not geological, it was, it was related to physical oceanography. They said, well, this is where the Humboldt current runs. It runs so far from my coast, and the resources there were not linked to the seabed, they were linked to the volume of water, to the column of water, where due to the Humboldt current, fishery was very rich. So this means that they extended their sovereignty outward, outwards, but it also means that they extended it vertically because they were claiming that they had first rights over, over the fisheries of their territorial waters. And I'm using these, these terms with quotations now because what happened immediately uh, but, but before going there, just, just to be clear, to make the pinpoint the argument that peripheral countries were key in making these 200 nautical miles the new limit, as opposed to the previous three uh, nautical miles that was defined as, as the canyon shot rule. So what happened very early on is that many different countries around the world started to unilaterally claim sovereign waters of different distances. And this, of course, created problems, and most of them were De dealt with, not solved, but dealt with bilateral agreements, but there was this sense that a scramble of the sea had begun and it would be good, after World War II in particular, to regulate it, not to, not to just countries, to, to let countries fight over this, mm, this newly conquered space, but, but to you know, make rules about it. Uh, these rules came first in 1958 with the first UN Conference of the Law of the Sea, which sanctioned the, the artificial number of 200 nautical miles as the official mm, um, distance to which countries could claim their sovereign waters. And it sanctioned other rules that were being developed at the time, but it left many, many blanks, many gaps, which were postponed. And they were postponed until the second UN Conference of the Law of the Sea, which uh, occurred in, or was signed in 1982, but it was being prepared for much longer. So negotiations started in 1973, but the very idea of launching such a conference came from 1967, and it was a, an ambassador from Malta in the UN, whose name was Pardo, and for, for Pardo, the need of making new rules was a need linked, or it was a necessity that, that was more, that was stronger in maritime peripheral countries. Why is that? The argument is basically, okay, big powers have obviously the upper hand because of technologies of accessing this space, 
smaller powers like Malta itself recently decolonized from, from British rule, smaller powers and landlocked powers that is maritimely peripheral countries, they really need to, to, to come together and they really need to protect the, her the common heritage of mankind, later called common heritage of humankind, uh, to make sure that big powers don't deplete the oceans that uh, belong to everybody. So with this view in mind, negotiations of the law of the sea started, resumed in 1973, and small countries and landlocked countries came together in a group called the Group of the 77, which was in effect exactly that. It was a group to make sure that smaller countries without access to the technologies necessary to redefine the maritime space had a say in how the maritime space was defined. So again, what I'm saying to pinpoint the argument in relation to the sessions that, that we have today is that peripheral countries did have a say in a process which completely transformed the way that we perceive and manage ocean spaces. Just to give some examples, um, 99% of the countries uh, with a coast, of coastal countries within the UN, have more maritime territory than they have land territory. And there are islands that have 88 and 90% and 90, and 90 of their territory is basically, actually 80%, there are several that 80% of their, of their territory is, is uh, territorial waters. So much larger than their land territory. And there is, of course, an oxymoron here be between territory, terra, and ocean and sea territory. But th this is this going beyond this oxymoron is precisely what happened in the in the UN Conference of the Law of the Sea. So one would think then, according to the narrative that I just presented, that mm, this was in line with the process of decolonization and the new redefinition of the, of the territorial space, of the maritime uh, space as territorial space, was, mm, I don't want to say equitative, but it was shaped by peripheral countries. However, the outcomes of the law of the UN law of the sea contain such surprising facts as the one that I started my written paper with, <laughs> and I think it would come as a surprise to most of you, President Macron uh, of France last year, 2021, he he presented a project with lots of millions of euros to for um, ocean exploration, and the way he justified that was saying, France is the second maritime power of the world in terms of surface of territorial waters. This this is completely at odds, I think, with the idea of decolonization. Because what we have here is that in the 80s, so right after colonization, and in a process that was participated by decolonized nations, um, a law of the sea was signed which granted countries like France and Great Britain huge amounts of territory because despite decolonization, they retained islands in the Pacific, mostly. I mean, Great Britain ha has islands all over the world. France as well, but mostly in the Pacific, the Micronesia, for instance. And for each of these islands, what you have is a 200-mile boundary. This 200-mile boundary is an exclusive economic zone, so it's not to completely equated to territorial waters, but it gives France the power to exploit, for instance, the seabed, and also preference over fisheries and so on. So, Mm, the complexity of the process that I wanted to point at in my paper is how, yes, peripheral countries were key in shaping the global redefinition, redefinition of maritime spaces, but this led to something that I think should make us reflect on usual narratives of decolonization, because what we have now is a world with many, many more boundaries than than ever before just because there are more more because territorial waters have expanded and that means that there are countries that don't have land borders but do have sea borders but it also led to the big countries 
the US, the Soviet Union, France, Great Britain, to expand their territories in ways that are completely unprecedented. And of course, one, may, one might, might say that that uh, expansion was mostly theoretical, but actually, um, as technologies for exploiting seabed resources, for instance, develop, this kind of sovereign authority could become much more relevant to actual economic issues, for instance, or military issues. So yes, this group of the 77 had a say in important, very important matters of the UN uh, law of the sea. In a paper uh, that I published in Diplomatic History, I studied, for instance, how they were instrumental in keeping straits as high seas only high seas, meaning freedom of the seas doctrine prevails. So maritime straits, um, they, the US wanted to keep them high seas. These countries um, accepted that, but for many other um, aspects, straits are, not co are considered sovereign waters. And this is one of the reasons why the US actually never signed the UN Conference of the Law of the Sea, because this group of the 77 was able to push for uh, for an interpretation of the law that was not convenient to U.S. interests. So yes, the group of the 77, as maritimely peripheral countries, had a say in shaping this, this law of the sea, but it was not at all hegemonic, or it was not at all uh, the only the only powers who shaped that law so that the end result in certain aspects comes to very strongly favor the old colonial powers anyway i am together with the group in the university of sevilla i am leading um, the project called deep met the discovering of the deep mediterranean sea in which we studied uh, which we in which we study these co-evolution between strategy and science and technology to understand how the Mediterranean deep maritime space has been perceived but also transformed and also divided through new maritime boundaries and frontiers. Again, I'm sorry for the format. I hope it works and thank you very, very much for your attention. Have a good session. <laughs>